So on the, at the end of the talk, I have um, the link to a couple of websites. Um, and if you guys have access to computers, you can actually go on at a public library. Never use a computer. Ah. Don't intend to start. OK. So, so there are actually patient printouts that I have at the clinic in Thousand Oaks that we, you can go on and essentially enter your blood pressure, enter your cholesterol, enter your A1C if you're a diabetic, and they actually calculate your risk of having a heart attack or any type of event in the next 10 years. So, so this talk is a cardiovascular disease prevention and we can talk about certain groups that are high risk. Um, why do we take it seriously? Um, so prevention is basically a field where we try to prevent the disease from happening in the first place. And the reason being um, is heart disease and atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in all of the world, okay? And up to 42% of deaths um, in women less than uh, 75 are due to cardiovascular disease. And when I talk about cardiovascular disease, I'm talking about commonly heart attack, which is what everyone knows, but a stroke is a manifestation of cardiovascular disease because it's a blockage of an artery in your brain. And one of the most common risk factors that we can control for is high blood pressure kidney failure and dialysis is due often to high blood pressure in the arteries supplying the uh, kidneys. So when you have high blood pressure in the kidneys, which regulate your blood pressure, you end up on dialysis long term if the blood pressure is uncontrolled. And then people who have peripheral arterial disease, which is blocked arteries in the legs, that's another form of vascular disease. Um, and that's the number one cause of amputations right now in the United States. It's not because of veterans coming back, but in the elderly people over 65, the number one cause of amputations is due to blocked arteries and poor circulation um, down below that we can't treat. So, let's get that. So who benefits from it? Basically everyone. I'll show you the next slide, the incidence of heart disease and why it's so important. And then overall, the cost of it is uh, quite big. Essentially, by the time you're 75, over 80% of people have some form of cardiovascular disease. And that we're talking heart attack, heart stents, congestive heart failure, stroke, or peripheral arterial disease or kidney disease. And those are all manifestations of, quote, cardiovascular disease. Um, and the cost to the United States alone is $298 billion a year. So that's why it's really important that we try to treat these diseases and get it under control so that people don't, we don't suffer from the late sequelae or the long-term complications of it. What's the sequelae when it's at home? So the sequelae are strokes, limb ischemia or amputations, dialysis. You know, once you go on dialysis, the average- What's sequelae mean? Oh, the end, end result or the consequences. So we know that once someone ends up on dialysis, on average, they only live about 12 years. So, um, so we, my job is, as a cardiologist is to prevent you from ending up on dialysis. And that's through work with your primary care doctor and if needed, an endocrinologist and a kidney specialist so that you don't end up on dialysis. So things that we have no control over, number one, age, number two, males, number three, if women postmenopausal. And the reason we know that is women tend to develop heart disease about 10 years after guys. And you hear a lot about guys having heart attacks in their 40s and their 50s. It's uncommon and it's unlikely that you would hear of a woman who has had a heart attack in her 40s. And it's because we menstruate and that menstruation is actually protective. And it's not until we go through menopause and after menopause do does our risk of developing heart disease really go up? Um, so other things, family history. So if you have a family member who's had heart disease early, you're most likely to be predisposed to it. Doesn't mean you'll get it, but it means that you're at higher risk than your average patient. And if you do have that history, then I would recommend that you talk to your primary care doctor or a cardiologist just about getting an overall risk assessment. 
you know, checking your cholesterol, checking to see if you're a pre-diabetic. Um, there are certain special types of cholesterol panels and certain blood tests that are now available that can screen your average person and let you know if you're at elevated risk more than your average person. Um, and race, and we know African Americans, Hispanic uh, Americans, and um, Native Americans are at higher risk, and that's a genetic predisposition that we cannot control for. So things that we can control, smoking we know increases your risk of heart disease. In general, that risk goes down about 10 to 12 years after you've quit smoking. So after you've quit smoking, that risk after about a decade goes down significantly. Cholesterol, particularly your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, and the way I remember is L stands for low density lipoprotein. You want that as low as possible. H is your good cholesterol, so you want that as high as possible. So when you know you get a printout you want a, your LDL to be as low as possible other things so what's the ratio have to do with it then so it all so the ratio of LDL to HDL that you're talking about particle are you talking about particle size well there's the you get the high, the high the low and then there's a ratio yeah so the LDL in general is usually calculated it's not directly measured so it's based on a ratio of your triglycerides, your total cholesterol. And we know the ratio of high cholesterol, the higher your cholesterol is, the good cholesterol, your HDL, and the lower your bad cholesterol is, the better. So in general, a ratio greater than uh, 1.4 is good. Okay, so, um, and we can talk about that a little bit. There's other studies um, talking about lipoprotein particles, which are when you break down your LDL. Um, they even break down your LDL into subparticles, meaning large LDL particles and small LDL particles. Correct. Um, again, weight. We know people who have a body mass index, which is your height divided by your weight over 30 are at higher risk. We know that people who are physically inactive are at higher risk. And then there's been studies that suggest that people who are prone to emo emotional stress, anger, and things like that, you increase your risk of high blood pressure, increase your risk of stroke. As far as heart disease, that's a little bit controversial. So people with type A personalities, it was long thought that they were at increased risk of heart disease. Now the data is a little bit more mercury. So special groups of people are patients with diet with diabetes or kidney disease. And we know anyone with diabetes, especially if they're on insulin, we treat them as if they've had a heart attack or they have heart disease because their chances of developing heart disease are so much greater than anyone without diabetes. People who have had prior heart attacks, stents, angioplasty are at also at higher risk. People with blocked arteries in their neck, that's what is considered carotid stenosis, are at very high risk because again, block the arteries in your brain, in your neck, in your legs, it's a surrogate because it suggests that you may be at increased risk of blocked arteries in your heart also. It's a disease of the blood vessel. So if you're developing clots and plaque buildup in your brain and your legs, you're most likely going to have plaque buildup um, in the arteries of your heart. Um, and then people uh, with um, special considerations. So there's now a lot of interest in people with erectile dysfunction, in particular because we know that certain types of erectile dysfunction is due to poor circulation in the arteries that feed certain areas. And one of those areas is the artery that causes erectile dysfunction. So there's actually been studies out there and the American College of Cardiology is actually now recommending screening. So anyone who has erectile dysfunction, they should actually get assessed for heart disease. Um, and then certain people with inflammatory diseases. So um, over the last 10 years, the theory has been that heart disease has been due to an inflammation of the lining of the arteries. So we know people who have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and certain other autoimmune disorders that cause inflammation um, of the joints also have inflammation of the arteries. And we know that when someone presents with an acute heart attack, it's usually due to uh, inflammation and friable plaque, which is a blood clot that breaks away from that artery and then goes downstream and causes a heart attack. So people who have autoimmune disorders such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis are also at, considered a higher risk. Um, and then people with sleep apnea are also at higher risk um, of, 
arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, developing high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, etc. So, unfortunately, that didn't show up, but there's something called the Framingham Risk Score, and I have it slides or handouts at the clinic. And this is something you can Google. It's one of three risk tools that you can uh, essentially plug in. You plug in your age, whether you're male or female, whether you're a diabetic, whether you smoked. Um, and then if you know your cholesterol panel, you would put it in there if you have high blood pressure. And it generates a, a score basically telling you your risk of developing heart disease or a heart attack within the next 10 to 20 years. And the Framingham start Heart Study is out of Boston. They essentially studied a group of people in Framingham, Massachusetts, which is about 30 minutes outside of Boston. Um, and they looked at all the risk factors and they looked at, then they followed them for 40 to 50 years and s looked at who developed heart disease. And they it basically came up with essentially the risk factors that we know of today. And based on that, they're able to calculate your risk of developing um, heart disease in the next 10 years. So I think one of you guys had suggest, uh, asked about other biomarkers. There's certain blood tests that we can do. So one is called HSCRP. That stands for high sensitivity uh, CRP. It's a protein or a blood assay that we use to look for inflammation of the arteries. We know that people who have high HSCRP have most likely inflammation of the arteries in their heart. Other things are homocysteine, if you've read about in the news. So some people take uh, certain vitamins. If you have elevated homocysteine levels, we know that you're at increased risk of heart disease. And then something called carotid intima media thickness. It's an ultrasound where they measure the thickness of the arteries in your neck. And we use that as a surrogate for who's at increased risk of heart disease. If you take a good history, talk to the patient, you can assess whether they have symptoms of heart disease, number one, and you can ask some questions like what are you on blood pressure medicines what is your cholesterol do you have a family history and we can assess that and based on that we can cardiologists and primary care doctors can assess your general risk i generally reserve these for people who have a very high risk such as if you have a family history meaning your siblings your parents passed away or had heart attacks in their 40s but you're otherwise healthy and you ask me, should I be on a statin, which is the cholesterol medicine? Should I take an aspirin? And all your risk factors come back negative. I may say, well, if you really want to know, we can check one of these tests to see if you're at the higher risk. We can check your cholesterol and something called lipoprotein. So I told you about the good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. Some doctors are now advocating fractionating, meaning taking that bad cholesterol and even dividing that up into further particles, meaning big particles, little par particles, because even when you have bad cholesterol, that LDL, not all of that bad cholesterol is truly bad for you. So when you break down LDL, there's large LDL particles and small LDL particles. And we know it's the small LDL particles that are what seep into the arteries and cause heart disease. So, so I have patients who have you know, mildly elevated LDL, but when you fractionate it or break it up, it's mostly that large type. And we know that large type generally does not c cause heart disease or heart attacks. What's the name of that panel that shows the... There's two different ones out there. One is called the VAP, V-A-P, and the other one is called an NMR. So they're different ones. Some insurances will pay for it and other insurances will not. So. Other things we wouldn't, I would be str a strong advocate for is to know your blood pressure goals in particular. So every time you check your blood pressure, every time you go to your doctor's office, you should say, what's my blood pressure? What should it be? So in general, if you're on three or more blood pressure meds, that's when we worry that you have resistant hypertension, meaning difficult to control hypertension. We start looking for secondary causes. The number one cause of high blood pressure is just the arteries getting stiffer. And that's because of our diet in general, if you look at evolution, you know, cavemen never ate salt. So nowadays we eat a lot more salt than we really need. And in time that causes the arteries to stiffen and get harder. And you can imagine it's like a bodybuilder when they're pumping a lot of muscle or a lot of pressure, the heart and the arteries get stiffer. And that's what causes high blood pressure is the stiffening of the, the arteries. I thought it was wives. <laughs> 
So in general, most people, we can treat high blood pressure with one, two, maybe three medicines. Once you get to four and five medicines, then you really should be seeing a kidney doctor or a cardiologist to look for abnormal causes of high blood pressure. So in general, we would say the definition of high blood pressure is a blood pressure greater than 140, the top number, or greater than 90, the bottom number, on three separate occasions. Because you could be angry one day, in a bad mood another day, eating a ton of salt another day, but it has to be really on three separate occasions, then we would classify you as having high blood pressure. When you look at diabetics and who gets diabetes and who gets problems from the diabetes, meaning heart disease, dialysis, um, it's people with uncontrolled diabetes, and that's people with a hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of how well your sugars are controlled, um, greater than seven. And most people now recommend a hemoglobin A1C less than six and a half. So um, cholesterol, we talked about. The cholesterol target is a moving target, meaning if you have no risk factors, your LDL should be less than 160. If you have one risk factor, it should be less than 130. If you have two or more risk factors, we recommend less than 100. If you've, you're a diabetic, you've had a stroke, you've had heart disease, meaning you've had angioplasty, you've had a heart stent, you've had bypass surgery, then we recommend that LDL less than 70. So all kind of depends on your risk factors. So this is a classification of high blood pressure. So like I said, a normal blood pressure is less than 140 over 80. Pre-hypertension is that area where it's kind of mercury, murky, and we tell you to watch it. We generally advocate changing your diet, meaning cutting out fast foods, deli meats, canned soups, frozen dinners, because those are all high sodium uh, meals, um, and then trying to exercise. After about six months, if people are still not able to control their blood pressure despite an earnest effort to change their diet, to increase their exercise, um, then we would start you on uh, blood pressure meds. And then we break it up into stage one, which is mild to moderate uh, high blood pressure, and stage two is really high blood pressure. Um, if you're a diabetic or you have kidney disease, we advocate for a more aggressive blood pressure goal also. So this is the cholesterol guidelines that I told you about for the LDL. Optimal is less than 100 if you have two risk uh, heart disease, so less than uh, 100. So two risk factors we say less than 130, and zero to one risk factors we say um, less than 160. And then who should take aspirin? Yep, so the reason being, this is the primary target, okay? So triglycerides um, are the secondary target. So when you, when you come to see your primary care doctor or a cardiologist, we recommend treating this first. After we get the LDL to go, then we would address this. But this is, we know LDL is the principal cause of heart disease. In, if, your, if your triglycerides are too high, it will distort your LDL. Yes, it's and, and it's and that's what I was getting at because I do have a cardiologist, okay. um, and that is exactly what was happening. And so I actually take two capsules of fish oil morning and night, mm -hmm. takes care of the triglycerides, and I'm back to normal. Yeah, and that's probably if you it's because your triglycerides probably are greater than four or five hundred, yeah. and it's because the LDL is indirectly measured by a fancy formula that we indirectly measure. You can directly measure your LDL, but in general, when you order just that, rant, that routine cholesterol panel, that fasting panel, it's the indirect measurement. You have to specifically ask for the direct measurement. So, um, so if you have elevated triglycerides, usually it's a familial thing, meaning someone in your family, one of your parents or something has that. And in general, we know that's the exception, yeah. I don't see it on this chart, but I've, I've heard it said that the LDL, you want a lower number, but the HDL, you want a higher number. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. that's, what, that's what we talked so about. Actually then, <clears throat> it shows, on the LDL, it shows the high number at the bottom, that's mm -hmm. bad, 
On the HDL, it shows the high number on the bottom. That's good. So that's confusing. Yeah, so basically what this is, and it may be a little confusing, if, you, if your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, is less than 40, that's bad, okay? For, and that's for men. For women, if it's less than 50, it's considered, you know, you have very low good cholesterol. Ideally, we want it higher than 40 or higher than 50. So most people, most women, if they're premenopausal, it can be up to the 70s and 80s. It's usually after menopause that this, that ratio changes. Lousy LDL, you want a low number. Protective LDL, or HDL, pardon yes. me. Protective HDL, you want a high number. Correct. So H stands for high, so you want that as high as possible. And then who should take aspirin? So in 2010, the U.S. Uh, Preventive Task Force, uh, which is kind of the governing body that makes recommendations on who should get uh, aspirin, who should take cholesterol medicine, who should get a colonoscopy, who should do, get a screening for prostate cancer, breast cancer. They came out with a new position and basically said that you had to look at the overall uh, risk profile. So in men between the ages of 45 and 79 years old or women between the age of 55 and 79 years old, if you have two or more risk factors for heart disease, then they recommend taking a baby aspirin. If you have zero to one risk factors and not a really good convincing story, you may want to reconsider. The reason being we're seeing an increased number of GI bleeds, so stomach ulcers and bleeding complications from it. So you really, you know, before we used to say everyone should take a baby aspirin, but now they're cautioning and urging us to kind of reconsider and look at your risk factor profile. After the age of 79, it becomes a little bit murky. The reason being people tend to fall more you know, you're going to bruise more. You may already be on a blood thinner called Coumadin or Prodaxa for other indications such as stroke or arrhythmias. So aspirin might not be so good for you. The way I read that, they're, they're asking you to take aspirin almost half your life. Almost <laughs> half your life. So they're saying if you have two or more risk factors. So, or if you have a stent or heart disease, you know, most people who've already had a stent or bypass, they should be on aspirin to prevent another heart attack, their stent from closing off, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's because very few people under 45 get heart disease. Very few people under 45 have heart attacks. So that's why, you know, we know that for men, you can see after age 45, their risk of developing heart disease goes up. For women after the age of 55, which for most women, they've already gone through menopause by then, their risk of heart disease goes up. And then high-risk patients, like I said, um, I alluded to earlier, people who've had heart, heart attacks, bypass surgery, angioplasty stents, diabetics, people with uh, peripheral arterial disease, which is disease of the arteries, those people, for the most part, I would say, should at least be on a, a baby aspirin. And then diet. Now, if any of you guys have read the New York Times, about two weeks ago, they came out with um, the headlines about the Mediterranean diet. And basically what they found is people who are on the Mediterranean diet have a 30% lower risk of heart disease than people on a standard heart healthy diet. So the Mediterranean diet comes from, you know, Greece, Italy, and that region. And it's a diet high in oily fish, which is tuna, salmon, or mackerel, fish generally that comes from the ocean and not from a lake, um, a diet high in olive oil and nuts. And they found that that diet is better than the traditional American heart healthy diet, which is composed of more um, less uh, saturated fats, uh, low salt, fiber, fruit, vegetables. So this is the diet that we had generally been advocating, but this diet um, has now been proven uh, to lower your risk of heart attack above and beyond this traditional heart healthy diet. I'm sure it's not the wine and the siesta. <laughs> that could help too. So, um, so alcohol does raise your blood pressure in high doses. So the current guidelines say for men, that means you should drink less than two glasses of wine, uh, beer, or any other spirits a day. And for women, it's less than one glass a day. Obesity. So, 
So the current um, American Heart Association has made a big effort to push for uh, walking 10,000 steps a day. We know that if people walk 10,000 steps a day, it leads to weight loss and it also leads to improved cardiovascular health. So they're making a big push right now and they're at, at some institutions, they're actually giving away free pedometers. So if we can stick a pedometer on you and see how much you walk a day and you see it and you log it, um, we know that we can get people to walk at least 10,000 steps a day. Um, Excuse me? What is 10,000? So that's, that's the big program that the American Heart Association is pushing um, to get people to be physically more active. I think she but means is it a mile? Three miles, five miles, miles, ten miles. Oh, Three that miles. I don't know the distance, distance wise. Um, it does need to work because my legs were probably about four miles. So much shorter than me would be obviously less than that. So yeah, that's a, number it's of a funny uh, category. Yeah. 10,000 steps. Yeah, for me, It'd probably be half your distance, so. Um, now, if you guys have any iPhones or any of those special Android phones, there are applications that you can download for free. Um, and then, you know, it hooks up to one of those armbands. You can actually carry around that cell phone and it will track that also. Do we look like the iPhone generation? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> That's true. So. Uh, so when it comes to exercise, the current gu guidelines recommend two and a half to five hours of moderate intensity exercise or one to two and a half hours of vigorous intensity exercise. For most people, that's where you're getting your heart rate up, 130, 140, 150. So Just a week or a day? So a week. Thank you. So. <laughs> five hours a day. Yeah, yeah. No, so that's usually about three times a week for 30 minutes a day. And that's, if you're walking on a treadmill or anything, that's at an incline of usually three and a half to four where you're actually getting your heart rate up to a brisk, uh, you know, rate. You know, a heart rate of 70, 80, 90 really is not gonna do it. Usually we want your heart rate up above 110. If you're younger, we want it up 130, 140, 150. If you're in your 70s and 80s, generally that's around 110 to 120 is where we want your heart rate when you're exercising. So this is the, the site I was talk, talking about. It's the American, if you Google the heart.org or the American Heart Association, it has tools here. So we should ask our grandkids, right, to uh, yeah. for us. Yeah, <laughs> so. Um, God, that's too small for me even to see. Okay, so it's actually a great resource because if you look here, um, they have education. That's just as small as you made it. Okay, so if you look under the education part, they have one for patients. So they have menus and recipes for people who have high blood pressure. Similar to if you go to the American Diabetes Association, they actually have menus and recipes uh, for people who have diabetes. They also have uh, patient handouts where you can track your blood pressure, your cholesterol, things like that. If you've had heart disease, if you've had heart attacks, or if you're wondering about signs and symptoms, they have a whole patient handout that has pictures and it's in layman's terms, okay? People who have heart arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation or any of those other arrhythmias, or you know, their doctor says you may need a pacemaker, they actually have an interactive site there that has a patient handout on that. Um, so it's a pretty uh, resourceful site. It's just theheart.org and under education right here. And so this is an example where you would go in and create your profile. And essentially you just enter your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar and your weight, and it tells you whether you're in excellent cardiovascular health, uh, needs improvement, or warning. So with that, I did. I'm going to end it and open up to questions. What do you huh? think about long-term use of statin drugs? So, lo so for a while, they were talking about putting statins even in your water because we know that with statins, we've been able to decrease the risk of further development of cardiovascular disease. So when someone comes into the hospital with an acute heart attack, we actually give them the highest dose of statin because we know it stabilizes that plaque. It, number one, it decreases your risk of stroke. Now there's some controversy about whether it may 
increase your risk of developing diabetes about 5%. Um, but long term, it's been well established. About two or three years ago, there are questions about whether it can cause cancer, but that hasn't been proven yet. But we've had, they've been around for 15 or 20 years, and um, so far they're very well tolerated. It's one of the most uh, frequently prescribed heart medications around the world. Do you have specific concerns about statins? No. My, my husband is on statins, mm -hmm. and his cholesterol has come down mm -hmm. from the statins but he hasn't necessarily changed his diet. So to me, to me, it's... Uh, <laughs> there goes that stress. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I just don't know, just because the drug does that. Mm -hmm. So I had asked his cardiologist if he should have a CAT scan mm -hmm. to see about the arteries, but the cardiologist didn't agree with that. Yeah, but, I don't like the CAT scan only right. because it's radiation. So we know... What do you think about the LEXA scan? That's even more radiation. I just had that. He just right. had that done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so, and if, actually, he came back fine. and it said everything was normal. Yeah. So, so that's good. So should he stay on statins then? Yeah, because we know it. You know, do you have a history of heart disease? Pardon me if I, I don't. Have, know. I haven't uh, had. No, but uh, she doesn't like the idea of me staying on statins. I don't mind at all. Mm -hmm. I I had had. Uh, have, uh, we've gone for testing all the time for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and my cholesterol at one point, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, was 330. Okay. And uh, they put me in a test where they put me on statins, Lipitor at the time. Mm -hmm. And within six weeks, it, was, it, it dropped at 150 points. And so I'm fine with it. I have no problem. Yeah. So we know it increases your risk of diabetes by a small percent. I okay. Do have diabetes, yes, diabetes. That's from family <laughs> tests. So yeah. So we don't, we don't count that. Um, so there's not been strong evidence that it increases your risk of cancer. That was a concern at some point. But, but it's not a false reading if the drug is bringing down your cholesterol and not your diet? I would agree with him because it melts away that cholesterol. So we, we know that, that low, the lower your LDL, the less likely that it's going to build up in the arteries of your heart. So that's like I have patients who say, I ask them, do you have high blood pressure? And they say, no, my blood pressure is always 120 over 80. And I said, well, you're on two blood pressure medicines. So <laughs> technically, you do have high blood pressure because if I take you off that, your blood pressure is going to go up. So um, same with cholesterol. You know, unless you make a major change in your diet, your LDL and your total cholesterol are probably going to be high unless you take the cholesterol medicines. Does that LEXA scan show the arteries? Does it show the blockage of the arteries? So the way LEXA scan works is it's a, a medicine that causes the arteries to dilate, so open up and get bigger. If you, all normal arteries are able to do that, if you have a blocked artery, that artery cannot dilate. So when we take pictures, we look at the relative lack of blood flow. So we compare it normal to abnormal. So if all the arteries are normal, great. If there's one artery that's blocked, then we can see a difference between that artery, the blocked artery, and the abnormal artery. So then it does show blockage of the arteries? It shows uh, what we consider a significant amount, meaning greater than 70%. There's not a great test to diagnose heart disease that's less than 70%. And we know that if you have like a 30 or 40% blockage, we would recommend treating you with a statin and an aspirin because people with 30% and 40% blockages don't necessarily need stents because stents, you know, will never save your life unless you're having a heart attack. So, so how, did, how is it determined the 30 to 40 percent blockage? A CAT scan or an angiogram, which is where they go inside your heart and they actually take pictures of your heart. And that's well, really the problem, as this gentleman said about insurance, because insurance companies don't even want to cover those things. I'll just interrupt for a second because other people may have questions. But but, but on that Lexi scan that they did prior, mm -hmm. prior day, they did the other test where they... they did the ultrasound of your heart? or it for, to, to cause stress on your heart. Mm -hmm. And then they said they were going to compare those two pictures, yeah. the stress and the, and the rest. Yeah, yeah. so the, uh, the test is a long test. that It can be done in one or two day protocols. So the, there was a... I actually had the, the resting um, stress test and then the stress test itself. Yes. Right, that's where they do the had. echocardiogram see pretty much you can see everything it works yeah, right and um, my wife has it too and she you can actually see she's got a little plaque in 
her arteries on both sides. And that was the, that but was. You can't see. There's none in mine. You can't see it, but you definitely can see it in hers. Um, so you up her life insurance, right? Yes. <laughs> but humor aside, the the big the big thing was is that um, with with that uh, the doctor I have a he's a cardiologist, but he actually treats me a little differently than a person that normally would have let's say all the risk factors mm -hmm. because I don't have any of the cult, the artery, arterial issues that would accompany it. And that may be because you're on medicines that control your mm, triglycerides. Just before that. Maybe. Okay. And we, this is an ongoing process mm -hmm. and things like this, but uh, most of mine is heredity. It's mm -hmm. got nothing to do with almost anything else. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had guys who are 29 that have had a heart attack, and that's because every single, their brothers, their uncles, their dads, their grandfathers all had heart disease. And, you know, they work out, they exercise, but there's certain genes that we just can't um, prevent. In my, in my family, it's predisposed for high blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, the last lecture, the cardiologist said the children as young as two years old can have uh, blocked arteries. Yeah, so not necessarily blocked arteries, but plaque which is build up, right. yeah. And we know that for, for sure. And that's why we don't advocate stenting in everyone, only those who have number one symptoms or number two have significant blockages that we know may cause problems. So it's too bad there isn't a test that could just tell you whether or not your arteries were clogged other than the Lexa scan or the CAT scan. So there's, a, the stress, there's another stress test called a treadmill stress test or a chemical stress test, and it's an ultrasound of your heart, and we, do, we get you stressed either by walking on a treadmill to increase your heart rate, or we give you a medicine that causes your heart rate to go up. It's similar to kind of like adrenaline, so your heart's racing really fast, your heart's pumping, and it does not involve radiation. It's an ultrasound of your heart. Similar to an ultrasound when women are pregnant and they have babies, it's, there's no radiation. So in general, we recommend that unless for some reason we can't get good pictures or there's another issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, I would hope someday there would be something that you could just know early on in your life, like your child could know at five, six years old, that whether or not the arteries were clogged because then the child would have a different diet. I would argue that you eat a healthy diet lifelong, you know, oh, before. Right. No, I, yeah. I agree with that, but I mean, if you were to tell a parent that their child at five years old had blockage, then the parent, a normal parent, would change their diet. Yeah. But at this point, there's nothing that can really determine that in a young age. We, we can take a look at risk factors. So I, I have patients who see me for preventive cardiology because they know their dad had a heart attack at 45 they're in their 50s and 60s and they've never had it because they watch their diet and they exercise and they may never develop heart disease knowing that you know they lost their a parent in their 40s or 50s of heart disease people have made a conscious effort to change their lifestyle and i have patients who have well outlived their parents and have never developed heart disease because they made that lifestyle choice Any other questions? Yeah, so I'm confused. Uh, <clears throat> another cardiologist did a slideshow, mm -hmm. and I hope I'm not misrepresenting what he said, but I thought what he said was that it's not all that unusual to have plaques. Mm -hmm. The thing that kills you is when the plaque ruptures. So what you want to prevent is that event. You don't want the plaque to rupture. Correct. And that's going back to, people can have plaques that are 20%, 40%, 50%. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna to progress to 70, 80, 90% to the point where you're getting chest pain. And we know statins in general stabilize that plaque so that it doesn't rupture. You said that earlier, stabilize. So this is, this is the goal, we wanna stabilize such plaques as we may have and prevent their growing and or rupturing. Correct. And that's why when someone comes in with a heart attack, we give them Lipitor 80 milligrams, which is the highest dose to prevent that, you know, and to try to stabilize that. One other thing, uh, I don't think I'm confused on this point, but I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you'll validate this. So 
at this other uh, slideshow. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, it was slides, it, not so much PowerPoint. But they put out that older people like myself, <laughs> some of you may laugh because I'm in my 60s, but that we could carry around in our pocket two aspirins. And if you started to have an event, you should eat the two aspirins and call 911. Correct. Was, was that good advice? Yeah, so you need to chew it because if you just swallow it, when it's going to take eat, 30 minutes I'm to sorry. dissolve. When I said eat, I, I did mean chew. Yeah. They said don't swallow it, they said chew it. Pop them and chew them as you're dialing 911. Yeah. So that was good advice? Yes. Now, do you know the signs of a heart attack? Uh, no, but I think what they said was this gives your body a chance while you're going to the hospital, the aspirin's already working, doing something good. They're yep. going to do other stuff when you get there, but it's helpful as you're being transported. Yep. Yes? No? Maybe yes. so? Yes. So, symptoms to worry about are chest pressure or tightness, usually in the center of your chest or the left. People often say, it's like someone standing on my chest or an elephant, you know, yeah. sitting on my chest. Yeah. So in women, about 50% of the time, we'll get that, okay? Symptoms where it radiates down your arm, especially your left arm, into your throat, your jaw, you know, in your back. Symptoms get worse when you exert yourself, meaning you're walking, doing something. So that's the most common symptom in men. In women, only about 50% of women get chest pain. The other 50% get kind of nonspecific symptoms of extreme fatigue out of the ordinary, meaning, you know, before you're exercising, able to take out the garbage, and now just houseless chores and things like that make you more tired than normal. You might have the jaw pain, the throat tightness, but not necessarily that chest tightness. Um, people often get sweaty or clammy, things like that. You reminded me of something that was said. You, you talked about, I think, postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how women present differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they talked about was nausea. And I don't know if this is tongue in cheek, but they said if you feel like you got morning sickness and you're 60 years old, it could be a heart attack. I would agree. So, can you tell us a little bit about that sensation somebody might feel in the back if you mm -hmm. have a heart attack? So, is you it know, like a muscle pull kind of a it can, pain, yeah. Or is it a, a squeezing? What, what kind of sensation some, might one it's, it's all different in some people. I've had people who say a sharp stabbing pain in between their shoulder blades or, you know, just pain and ache. A lot of times people say, who've had heart attacks, and I ask them, why did you wait a day or two? And they said, oh, I was feeling crummy, but they weren't really able to tell me any symptoms, you know. They said, oh, my stomach hurt. I was a little nauseous. I was just feeling pooped, you know, but not necessarily having the flu but they just said they knew something was wrong, but they couldn't quite pinpoint it. And the symptoms can come on at different times, so it might start with like this back pain, and later on you might start feeling, say, nauseous. Yeah, and generally if you're having it, it's gonna slowly get worse. You know, it's not gonna go away. You know, if you did some heavy lifting, you strain, you take some Advil, it's gonna go away. But, you know, people with heart disease, it generally c continues to, st they call it stuttering pain. So, um, so, the other thing I'd like to let you guys know is that heart disease is actually the number one killer in women. It's not breast cancer, but more women die of heart disease. Three times as many women die of heart disease as they do uh, than of breast cancer. It's just the oncologists have done a better job of educating everyone, a lot better than the cardiologists. But heart disease is actually the number one killer in women. They do worse from it because number one, they're older. The, you know, women tend to get heart disease in your 60s, 70s, and 80s. So by then, you're more likely to have other risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that. Number two, the arteries are smaller. So our stents are limited. You know, two and a half millimeters, 2.25 millimeters is really the smallest stent that we can put in. And women tend to have smaller blood vessels. So, and then we know when they have heart disease, they just don't recuperate as well as guys. So, and then a lot of times they may wait a day or two because they're not getting the chest pain. So they think, oh, it's nothing, you know, and they ignore it. So a lot of times women will wait a day or two and by then, you know, much more damage has been done. I'm 
curious about what other symptoms, what may have caused symptoms. But two weeks ago, this is that's exactly what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Tremendous pressure on my chest, my jaw still felt terrible. Mm -hmm. I called a cardiologist and he sent me to the emergency room. I was there overnight with EKGs and, mm -hmm. and, and echo stress the next day, and then we had this nuclear medicine test the other day. But there, no one, no one found any any answer as to what might have caused it. And it was tremendous pressure. My, I said I was like my brother-in-law. He's 450 pounds sitting on my chest. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the jaw thing and the whole deal. What what other things could that have been? That so no, one, no one has a conclusion. Yet. So you can have artery spasm. We know women tend to get it more than men, but men do get it where the arteries clamp down and then they let go, clamp down and let go. And we would treat that with nitroglycerin or a medicine called a calcium channel blocker. That's what they gave in the hospital. Did it get rid of your pain? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so you may have spasm, which is, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, about five, ten years ago, um, they came out with this CAT scan, essentially, where you go through and you take pictures of the arteries and look at calcium. And calcified arteries can cause heart disease. The problem is it tends to overestimate um, the narrowing because of something called blooming artifact. If you've ever taken a look at, you know, x-rays and if you have dental fillings, it creates that bright shadow, you know when you get your teeth. Same with heart, the heart. If you have arteries that are calcified, it may overcall a blockage. So a blockage that is 40%, they may call it 80%. So, so it's a good screening in saying, hey, you do have some plaque, but it really can't quantify how much plaque. What about the valves? They get calcium on deposits on the valve? They do. So the aortic valve is the, the main valve that pumps blood out of your heart to your brain and to the rest of the body. And we know that that's the most common valve that ages over time. It gets calcium buildup. And we know that people who are on dialysis, they're at significant increase. That valve calcifies really fast in people on dialysis because they're not clearing their calcium. So we're not supposed to take any calcium supplements? So, so that's a little controversial. Um, two weeks ago, they came out with a study that said people who take calcium supplements, guys, are at increased risk of heart disease, but not women, and we don't know why. And that's only been one study. So in general, I like to wait, and I like to have two or three studies that have confirmed it. So it's a relatively new thing. But no, calcium I think you should take because to prevent osteoporosis and fractures, as long as someone's monitoring your levels. So what do you think, 600 milligrams a day? Or? Depends on your calcium and vitamin D level. So. You know, most people can get away with taking a multivitamin, but it all depends on your calcium vitamin D level. You know, usually you have a DEXA scan to see how thin and osteoporotic you are, and they make adjustments based on that. Well, I think at one point we were taking 1,200 milligrams a day. Yeah. And then the um, endocrinologist said that's too much now, according to your blood test, so lower it to 600. Yeah. So you try to be really good and then... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's two, you've heard of too much of a good thing. Right, exactly. So, yeah, and so same with vitamins. You know, most people, I say it's fine to take. If your kidneys can clear it, you know, it would clear excess anything that you don't need. Um, but there is too much of a good thing, and there's people who have vitamin toxicity. So... So, you know how <clears throat> we're told to get a second opinion? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I was told that if, if you made a fist like this, that that would be approximately the size of your heart and that these vessels would be also approximately the size of those feeding your heart. So you were talking about how women, uh, you're less able to stint because the size is too mm -hmm. small to stint. Yeah. Um, for a man, if, if, if are those veins or arteries popping out on my veins? Head? Veins. Yeah. Okay. But just in terms of the size, then mm -hmm. that was meant to be a, a visual means, a, a point of reference to visualize mm -hmm. the sizes involved. So if, if a woman makes a fist on her hand and she sees little ones, this is why you're saying that a two two centimeter stent is not going to work because the vessel's not large enough to allow it. Yeah, but we can treat it with something called balloon angioplasty. 
which is, it doesn't clean it all out, but it opens up the artery, you know. Um, at UCLA, we're looking at stem cell therapy infusion when someone comes in with an acute heart attack by infusing stem cells in there to try to minimize the amount of damage done from the heart attack. I hope this is the last thing I bore the rest of the audience with, but they were talking about the difference between plumbers and electricians. Yes. And they were saying that most of what you hear relative to the heart has to do with the plumbing, mm -hmm. either the supply of blood to the heart, the chambers, or the valves. This is all the pumping and, and the flow of blood. But they, they were saying that what's truly dangerous in terms of not being able to save you is the electrical activity that if the heart, I can't remember if they said the heart stops or mm -hmm. we're talking about arrhythmia. Anyhow, if the electric, electrical activity is disrupted, you have 10 minutes yeah. that every minute represents 10% loss of the possibility of you ever being revived. Yeah, and it all depends on what type of heart attack. There's two types of heart attacks. One where the artery is completely blocked off 100%, you know, um, and depends on which artery it's blocked. We know that people survive um, heart attacks if they're the artery on the right side of your heart, what we call the right coronary artery, or the left circumflex artery, which is the main artery that supplies the back wall of your heart. Those are a lot better tolerated. The main artery that supplies two thirds of your heart, it's the front, and it's called the left anterior descending artery. And cardiologists joke that it's called the widow maker because if that's blocked and you don't get it open in time, you but, know what happens. But we're back to plumbing, and actually I, I was wanting to ask you a bit about the electrician, uh -huh. the electrical part. So the 10 minutes was that by the time your loved one could call 911 and they send an ambulance and transport you, the 10 minutes is gone and you're dead. And they were saying this is why now in public places they have the paddles because CPR will not reestablish the sinus rhythm. You can do CPR till the cows come home. It's the paddles that get the electrical activity reestablished. Is that is that right or is that not right? No, that's that's right. So if you have a heart attack, some people develop the unstable rhythm called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. That's the electrical circuit. No, yeah, that's um, the electrical instability that you are. Uh, alluding to. So not everyone gets that who has a heart attack, but some people do, and that's the rhythm that we have to shock. Sometimes a thump to the chest, you know, you've seen that, you know, in movies. Sometimes that can work, but most of the time that doesn't work. What about the uh, urban legend of coughing? I'm Not for that type of rhythm. For other types of rhythm, yes, but not for... Really? It wouldn't hurt to cough if, if you feel like you're dying? No. Most people are feeling too woozy and they're on the floor by then, though. Oh, okay. So I think when that's happening, if you remember to cough, then go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? How about fish oil supplements? So fish oil supplements are good. You know, they recommend, the problem with fish oil supplements is they're not regulated, so you don't know if they're pure or not. We know fish oil, in general, there's the commercial one where you have to buy it and it needs a prescription, um, works. As far as the other ones, we don't know who, who's regulating them because the FDA doesn't regulate vitamins. So it could come from China, it can come from somewhere else. It could be pure, it can have other supplements in it. Mercury. True. But it's, in general, even if you eat fish, they recommend fish from the ocean and not from the lake because fish from the lake has not been shown to have the benefits. All right. Ah, so you were saying that fish oil fixed the triglyceride thing, which then brought your panel into sync? Um, does I take probably more than does the fish oil raise the HDL? No. Unfortunately, uh, exercise is the best way to raise that it. That is unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> Statins do by one or two percentage points, and then niacin can. Niacin can be hard on you. It's a lot of side effects. You get the flushing, sometimes you get some GI upset. There's some long acting niacins where people take niacin with aspirin so you don't get the facial flushing and things like that. 
Not niacin. Or was it liver? Liver. Statins and, and niacin can. So um, it's because your liver is, the one, is what synthesizes or makes the cholesterol. So anyone on statins, they should at least get your uh, liver function tested once a year. So what about the, um, you know, we're talking about cholesterol and things like this. Everybody gets on it sooner or later. Not everybody, but quite a few. There's also the, the let's not absorb the cholesterol from what we eat, like mm -hmm. sedia and things like this. Um, but I've actually seen a couple of um, the AMA type journals mm -hmm. come in um, and they're saying that that's probably not what you want to ever do because it messes up your GI tract. Yeah, so um, I don't remember the name of it, but a few years ago there, there were some chips that you can buy that you know you can eat all you want because you're not absorbing it. Unfortunately, one of the side effects um, was the unpleasant uh, product of what they call anal leakage because you're leaking all those nutrients out. So, and you do need some fat to build cartilage and other structures. You know, amino acids and a lot of other structures are made out of fat. So you do need some, you can't just cut it all out. What about the, uh, she had, her doctor told her to take red yeast rice rather than mm -hmm. go on Yep, so red yeast rice actually has the same enzyme that are in statins. It's something called HMG-CoA reductase. That's the same thing that's in statins. We just don't know how much of it, you know. So, you know, you can say I take one, one tablet, but we don't know. Is it 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams? But it's the same active ingredient. No. Mm -hmm. No muscle pains. Yeah, and not everyone gets the muscle pains depending on what type of statin and your genetic predisposition. We know... Asians have a certain type of gene that doesn't let them clear, you know, Caucasians, etc. So not everyone has that genetic. So usually they'll try you on a couple of different ones. No. So I read that there's a bell curve distribution in the population and that the cholesterol numbers that they advocate for represent less than one-third of the population. Would you care to comment? What does that mean? I'm not sure what you're talking about. I know there's... Uh, that people unmedicated, mm -hmm. less than a third of the population has the number, the target numbers, mm -hmm. which I, I, what I take that to mean is that two-thirds of the population would have to be medicated to reach the target number. I'm not aware of that. Um, I know there's something called the J-curve, so for blood pressure, you know, we've always said the lower the better, but at some point, you know, too it gets low. too low, and Crazy. then it starts, yes, and it cr increases your chance of having other events. So they call it the J cur curve. So we want it low, low, low. At some point, it starts ticking up, and then it's not good. For cholesterol, there's never been proven. The lower, the better. There's never been proven a J curve. So you can never have too low of your bad cholesterol, your LDL. They used to talk about the daily dozen, the exercises <laughs> you should do every day. Well, yeah. this cardiologist was talking about the five. If you've had a, an event that when you leave his office, you're going to have five medications. Aspirin, statin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and probably Plavix. I think that, yeah, that sounds right. So. Uh, 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 Plavix is, is what? Clopridical, yes. For stents, yes. What is a tenolol? A tenolol is a beta blocker, so it's a blood pressure medicine that slows down your heart rate. I have a question huh? um, about TIAs. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's prone to TIAs. Um, she's, she's, she's had them and has gone to the hospital and they say, oh, this one will just pass. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, at what point is there um, where you feel like you need to go to the hospital or some of them pass quickly? So depends if the, t does she have, we have to look at a lot of things. Does she have atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular rhythm that predisposes to blood clots, number one. Does she have a history of migraines? Because a lot of cardiologists and neurologists have come up with the thought that people who we used to think had TIAs, it might be a complex migraine. People who, yeah, and not necessarily a TIA. People with what we 
call a patent for amino valley, which is a hole in your heart, um, yeah. can be predisposed to it. And so some people would advocate closing that hole. Okay. So it may not, you know, before we used to call a lot of these symptoms TIAs, and now we're rethinking that and thinking maybe it might be a complex migraine. Transient ischemic attack. So it's kind of like a mini stroke, meaning symptoms that mimic a stroke but last less than 24 hours. Yeah, because her one arm will always go numb. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and so if they treat the migraine with certain medicines, that may actually resolve. All right, thank you for coming. Thank you.